Hello and welcome to the Smart Betting Club podcast. I'm your host, Peter Ling. Today's episode is a follow-up podcast to discuss some of the questions that came in following the release of our five stages of betting podcast back in July. Now, those five stages are five steps on the betting journey from absolute beginner to experienced high-staking professional and all the things that you need to know along the way. Now, that podcast has proven to be quite popular and therefore uh, a fair number of questions came in. Some questions were in common, so we had a few similar questions uh, that people were asking. And so today we're going to try and tackle some of those key questions that have come in and provide some of our experience to you. Now, if you haven't listened to episode 59, I do recommend you listen to that prior to this episode. Of course, you can listen to this, but it might not make quite as much sense as it should. And there are actually, if you're an SBC member behind the SBC member paywall, there is a second, a part two of episode 59, whereby we get into some of the tips, tools and strategies that we follow and that we advocate for each stage. So there's plenty of resources there. And if you have listened to the first one or two episodes of this five stages approach, then uh, hopefully some of the points that uh, I'm going to get into today with my colleagues will uh, address some of those queries that you have. So let me introduce my two colleagues. First of all, I've got returning Josh Polloway. How are you, Josh? I'm fine. Thank you, Pete. Yourself? Very well. Thank you. Great to have you on, as it is to have Rowan Day, the writer of the SBC Bet Diary. Welcome back, Rowan. Oh, thank you very much. It's good to be back. It's great to have you both back on because the first pod was really well received and obviously we've had quite a few questions that have come in. And before we get into some of those questions, I thought I'd have a bit of an icebreaker to start off with, gents. Um, my question is, what has been your most profitable sport of the last 12 months? So, uh, and while you think about your answers on this one, let me tell you mine. Uh, it's tennis. Now, it's the funny thing about tennis, I was thinking about this, this yesterday, I don't think I've watched an actual live tennis game on TV in the last 12 months. But yeah, it's my most profitable sport. Tennis is just a great sport for betting on. There's no draw facility in it. And there's certainly an edge there. If you listen to, I've done podcasts with likes of Miguel Figueres and James from Tennis Pilot. There's some, some real edges there. So tennis is mine, guys. What would yours be? So mine is horse racing and particularly the Lucky 15 strategy, which for which I use the bookie bashing racing tracker to get the bet. So I was looking at my figures. It's interesting because I think if anybody's read the bet diary just this week, I was saying that I had my first substantial win of the year just last weekend. So it had been pretty heavy going between January and, and now. Not losing a great deal, but not making a great deal either. And then one bet suddenly boosted the profit tremendously. But actually last year, between February and the end of the year, I had, I think it was four substantial winning lucky 15s and just looking at last year's figures I, I brought those up quickly while you were talking Pete uh, and my ROI for that strategy was 68 percent wow which is obviously me running very hot which is probably why I ran a little bit cold in the last five, seven or eight months or so but put all that together that strategy is quite well clear from my second most profitable which is golf which is Still pretty decent at forty five percent ROI. So yeah, it was the uh, it was the horse racing for me. It's interesting for uh, Josh because that's like eight months of treading water this year. Yeah, but yeah, it's still the most profitable over the last twelve months when you yeah, and quite easily. So, but it's literally I've made almost a hundred percent more than the second most profitable. Wow. How about you, Josh? We've actually got a snap here. So, Pete, you'll remember probably a month ago I messaged you to say a place to look at 15 this morning and one of them's just won at 150 to 1. Do you remember that? I remember looking at the results coming in and texting you and saying, have you seen? <laughs> have you seen?" I was going out for, for dinner after the second one had run and won at 150 to 1. I can't remember what the second one was called, but it began with an M and that won at 10 to 1. So I had like 1,500 quid riding on a, a 28 to 1 shot. And unfortunately that didn't come in, but it was still a really nice payout. So... Rowan, we've had a very similar experience there that I've been treading water with the Lucky 15s all year, but that's paid well. Yeah. In terms of pure money, definitely horse racing, but that's my biggest turnover sport. Um, in terms of ROI, the back end of last year for golf was just ridiculous. So it just seemed to be every week we were getting a winner. And there's plenty of pants off, plenty of pants on head <laughs> back end of 2022. So yeah, in terms of cash, uh, horse racing, and then in terms of ROI, golf, 
So very similar to Rowan. I hope you wash those pants, Josh. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> the lucky pants. <laughs> yeah, no comment. <laughs> if you see a man running down the streets of uh, Wolverhampton uh, with his pants on his head on a Sunday evening, <laughs> yeah, can check your golf results. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good chance it's me, yeah. I hope so, anyway. Otherwise, something's gone very wrong. <laughs> well, there you go. We've got three different sports there. We've got tennis, golf, and racing. And there's so many different ways to, to skin a cat. Uh, golf is my second, and racing would be behind that and behind football, actually, for me. So, you know, everyone's slightly different, and that's what we try to, you know, illuminate through the first five stages podcasts and then, obviously, the material we have online. And we have a variety of approaches from, from what each of us do, and you'll be able to hear that in the first episode. Let me get on to the first question, then. Well, this one came in from Stephen, but we had a few on similar lines. So what he writes, you know, many of you might be thinking the same. He said, hi, Pete. I'm ready and looking forward to becoming an Advantage player. I would just like your thoughts before I start. I have 5K for my betting bank, and my goal is to grow this as quickly as possible. My thinking at the moment is to start with free services. I think maybe my bank is too small. But my other option is initially start with only bookie bashing, where I can split my bank into free sports under one subscription. Now, I am like Rowan in that I am comfortable at at implementing uh, sound advice and following orders, but I have a higher risk tolerance. I might, may have it totally wrong, but I would be grateful for your take on my starting point. Guys, who wants to jump in and try and answer what uh, Stephen's been asking? Yeah, there's a couple of things actually there that I'm just picking up on. And, and the first of them, actually, before we, we answer the crux of the question, is about growing the bank as quickly as possible. I, I think there's a, a bit of a distinction to draw between having an ambition and being eager and being impatient. And I think, Pete, I'm, I'm sure we, we've had discussions along these lines many times over the years, but I think it's important that you, if you're starting out, you're finding something that's working, you do it cautiously, you gain confidence in it, you then increase stakes, and then you find that from making a decent profit, you, you can really start to, to make some inroads and, and grow your bank quickly at that point. So I kind of think if you if you get the right services and you, you do what you need to do in the way that you need to do it, you just let nature take its course. And over time, your bank will grow substantially, as opposed to starting off from the front, right at the beginning, at the very beginning, off the front foot saying, right, I'm going to grow my bank as quickly as possible, because I think it's easy to get disappointed. I think we all know that we're better. We don't know. We've just been talking about it, haven't we, about treading water and there's suddenly a, a big profit. I think that's an important thing to, to know. Everyone wants to grow their bank as quick as possible. I think that's everyone's goal, but it's just not realistic, is it? All, you know, especially when you're starting out. Yeah, exactly. Experience tells us that. But moving on to uh, what he's saying there about, um, you know, how does he split his bank? I mean, first of all, I think £5,000 is a pretty good bank to start off with. It's a lot more than I ever started off with, I don't mind admitting. Yeah. So that's a, a really good size. And if anything, actually, that would make me even more cautious and, uh, and, and just find out exactly what I can do and, and what suits me. I think what you can do there, the £5,000, there's a question of is that enough? With bookie bashing, I started off with Lucky 15s. We've just been talking about how profitable that has been, but I started off with Lucky 15s, essentially doing 50 pence each way, which is £15 per Lucky 15. I had 100-point banks. So that's only £1,500. And I can honestly say over the last 12 months, although there have been drawdowns, I've not reached anywhere near even 50% of that bank as a drawdown. Now, that's not to say it won't happen. In the future, I'm sure it will. But I think that's a, a strong enough bank for that strategy, and it can bring you big returns. So that personally would be where I would start, particularly if I've got access to soft books. So Skybet in particular, with all their enhanced place races, Bet365 have good value there as well. That's where I made most of my money last year using the Lucky 15 strategy. And I'm pretty confident if you have access to that, over time, you'll make a really, really good profit. That obviously goes with the, the proviso that you have to accept that there's going to come a point where the books won't accept you winning for much longer and they'll close your accounts. But I think you're going to get to that point anyway. So it'd be interested to see what you two think about that, Pete. Josh, do, do you think it's worth sort of hitting those bookies and, and making the most of the positive value you can get from it? Or would you go for the longer game and, and possibly not hit them so hard with the lucky 15s. Maybe mix up lucky 15s with other types of betting. So if, you, yeah. if you're just going with lucky 15s and you're taking those value prices, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. Um, so I don't think it's a bad thing to do, but I think mixing it up with other things would be a good idea. The one thing I was going to say, I think that's a really good answer for Stephen based on what he said. I was just thinking for everybody else who's written in and asked the same question. I would start with one sport that I've got an interest in or that I've got a little bit of knowledge about 
just find one tip straw two and just kind of put your toe in the water and kind of get used to following tips, getting used to using sites to compare odds, getting used to logging on and placing bets relatively quickly, just to get into some kind of routines about the best ways to follow tipsters. I wouldn't be worrying too much about massive bank growth yet. I I want to be getting all my processes right, making sure that I understand odds and how everything works. So that would be my general advice for anyone who's at that first step. Yeah, I think what we don't know from this is how experienced he is, uh, if he's used tipsters before, if he's ever made a profit, what accounts he has. They're all questions I would say are really relevant here. But assuming that he has betting accounts and he's you know, got an idea of how the betting world works and how to place an each way bet or what even, how to run a bank for simple stuff like that, which is obviously worth getting to groups with, like a stage one approach. And if he's ready to start scaling up and hitting it hard, then yes, you know, look 15s is one angle. The only issue with the look 15s on the horses is that they are quite, bookmakers are more wary of them. They can benchmark them against Betfair SP quite quickly and the more kind of wary of anyone that's taking them. So it probably might, on its own, be something that could raise more interest in your account than other sports. So I would look at things like golf, uh, some of the football tips, other racing tips, especially if they're betting you know, in big races or closer to the off, not early prices, because you can then spread out uh, you know, your bets and your profit and loss, and you know, variance is your friend. So if you, you, know, you maybe have had some victories on uh, terms of horse racing on with one bookmaker, say Skybet, but then you, you've placed a load of golf bets with them that have all lost, then that's uh, in your favor, uh, even though you might be overall in profit or you've got wins in other accounts. So just spreading it around like that, A, helps to spread the chances of your account getting gubbed quickly. And also you haven't got all your eggs in one basket when it comes to betting and dealing with, with volatility. So you know, even just with one firm, Skybet, I will say, like I've been helping one person who's made basically turn a grand into six grand over the space of four months, just betting on golf with them. Uh, not betting huge stakes, but just taking a lot of value each way bets with them. Because, you know, some of these firms, these soft firms are often just really enticing terms and, and odds. You don't need to go too far or work too hard to actually make a profit with them. Just having a bit of patience, really. So uh, that that would be what my, my addition to that. Just to add to that as well, Peter, and again, I remember having this um, conversation with you last year. I was thinking, I, I don't know how my Sky Bet account is still going because I've hit it hard with, with the horses but and golf winners as well. And it's, you know, I don't seem to be getting away with murder. I don't know if they've just forgotten about me or whatever. I couldn't quite work it out. Um, but something that I did do that, that may be worth doing is, you, is a kind of a regular dabble with their um, sort of builder bet bets for the big televised football matches and that sort of thing placing in play bets at half time during a televised match you know the sort of typical things that that mugs do and the other town i don't want to go down the road i mean there's so much uh, information out there isn't there in terms of um, delaying restrictions and, and account closures but with these bookies in particular i think if you can put the odd mug looking bet on using your phone instead of the website on, on a laptop or pc that's the sort of behavior that they seem to like and that's what I did. And all I can say, and I know this is just one example, and it's anecdotal evidence, but my Skybet account lasted much, much longer than any other account. And I can only put it down. This was the only difference I had with this account with the others. That might be worth doing as well, just to make them think that yeah, your profile isn't all about hitting positive value horses all the time. No, and if you like, we talked about Bookie Bash and we're big fans of their website, and they have tools that are available to find neutral EV bets. Exactly. So things like that, where you can just find bets that... You know, especially if you can do things which are in play or which are really big liquid markets, you know, like Champions League games or whatever it might be, whereby, you know, they think, oh, well, actually, this guy's got a scattergun approach. I know some people swear by going chucking some money on a roulette or on the casino side of things and just to mix up the type of activity. Because if if you're a trader, right, if you're a bookmaker trader and you see a profitable account or a bunch come in front of you every day, a report gets run and you're captured within that, what they're going to look at if they just see you're taking really shrewd racing bets on <laughs> 10 runner handicaps where they're paying out the first five and you're betting each way and, and you've got that 10 times and a bunch of like, they're going to go right well this guy's gone but if they're seeing a bunch of activity across a range of markets not all of them are really sharp then you might get a little bit more wiggle room not always but and also it depends on how long you've had the account it's history and so on uh, Josh anything else to add into that one or should we get on to question two I was going to say so yeah uh, mixing the bets up Rowan's exactly right with using bet builders and bet builders are like any other kind of multiple bet. They don't have to be stupid bets. So you don't have to have over 13.5 corners. Player X to have four shots on target with his left foot. 
you don't have to put bets like that and you can put on relatively shrewd bets within a bet builder and using stuff like the bookie bashing tracker to find mutual EV is a really good way of doing that. Yeah, some good advice there. So let's move on to question two. Uh, this is a tr- slightly tricky one. It's coming from a few different people on the topic of bet brokers. So one question said as follows, there are a lot of brokers out there but it seems I'm not sure where to start. Which one is best for me? Can bet brokers be trusted? And are they illegal? Now, a tricky one, this, because, well, first of all, I need to caveat and say, well, you know, I'm no legal expert and you need to, you know, uh, go and investigate this and explore this for yourself based upon where you live because they are effectively a gray area in terms of legality. So each jurisdiction is going to be slightly different. You've got countries where betting is illegal, as in it's not licensed, and then countries where betting is legal, but bet brokers are not licensed. So you've got different levels of risk there. And in many ways, I would compare it to the Far East, where betting in many of those countries is illegal. But you have large European-based bookmakers predominantly who operate and offer the chance for people in those Far East countries to go and bet with them. Now, they aren't licensed, or in fact, betting is illegal in many of those countries, but it goes on. Lots of people use them because they are, don't need to be based in that country. They may be there based offshore. They could be in places like Curacao, or they could just be based in offshore locations. And you know, people can transfer money through different means, sometimes crypto and you know, all kinds of wallets and what have you are available. So uh, people can use bookmakers in the Far East, even though they're not officially legal. In many ways, bet brokers are the same. They're based offshore. And so therefore, they're not licensed. So that's the issue that you have. Now, if you're in certain countries like the US and Israel, for some reason, you are never going to touch a bet broker. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to get involved with you. The risk for them is too great. But other countries, it's often a case by case basis. You might not see it written down on a website. You might not see someone advertising to you directly, but indirectly, some people do. And that's generally what happens. They sign up and they they use those bet brokers. However, obviously need to caveat and say, look, there is a risk involved uh, in terms of the legality of that. It's a gray area. And there's a secondary risk as well in that, well, if you put a lot of money in with a bet broker that aren't licensed in the country that you're based in, and they decide to do a runner with your money, then you know, you're not going to be able to go to the police or the regulator and complain because, well, you frankly shouldn't have been doing that in the first place. That being said, I'm not aware of any bet brokers who have done that, but you know, the black swan, it could happen. Just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't. So there is all those levels of risk. And so really the onus is on you as an individual to, to ascertain where you live and what's available to you and whether you want to take that risk. I can't tell you whether that's suitable for you or not. And you generally won't find any information online that will tell you directly. There are some websites, but again, you have to you know, understand the risks involved uh, with that. So if you do want to use bet brokers, then they are, you know, in general, quite a stable, from my experience and understanding of them, some of them are quite well run and they are quite stable and have been around for several years. We've done some features on a couple of services, uh, bet brokers in the on the SBC mem- uh, members section to kind of explore and interview a few. And so if you're interested in that, you can go and check that out. But yeah, I, I think in terms of bet brokers, it's a bit of a hazy area. Uh, guys, do you have a- anything to add to, to what I've said? Yeah, I was looking at the bet brokers page last night, Pete, because I was doing a little bit of work on Demetrio Giotti. Um, might get onto him later. The one thing I was thinking as I was reading it is to treat it a bit like some of the licensed operators in this country. So the advice would be don't keep too much of your bankroll in one place. We've talked about this before about how it can be problematic getting your money out sometimes from some of these bookmakers. Yeah. Treat a bet broker exactly the same. So you don't want to be keeping half of your bank with a bet broker. You want to be taking money out regularly if you've had wins, maybe just keeping it down to a minimum level. So that would be my advice after reading through it. And even though we haven't recommended anyone on our page, there's a list of questions there that you asked the two bet brokers we interviewed they would just give you a pointer about the kind of things that you need to be thinking about when you're looking at a bet broker. So yeah, that would be my little bit on top. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. That's bet brokers. And obviously, you know, uh, it's a, it's a bit of a minefield that one, but go and, you know, you can also go and Google. There are some good resources out there as well that provide more information uh, on them if you're interested in it. So let's move on to question three. And this came in from Matt. He said, hi Pete, I've just listened to the five stages podcast and loved it. Can I ask what sort of bankroll would you be assigning to each stage? And also, with some of the reviews I've read, it said about reinvesting 2.5% of the profit back into the bankroll. Can you tell me more about that? That's from Matt. Gents, who wants to jump in on this one? 
Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll say a little bit about this. I think it's very difficult to know, isn't it, without knowing the what's available to the individual to, to use. Yes. Um, but just talking generally, I think it, a lot of people would be very surprised at just how small your initial bank needs to be. As long as you're a little bit patient and in terms of growing it, then a few hundred quid would cover it, I think. And, and again, Pete, I think you were similar. That's, that's how I started. And then you just grow from there. And that brings up to the question about reinvesting 2.5% of the profit back into the bank role. I, I think we do that, don't we, in the reviews, just to show the power that compounding yeah. can bring to your betting. And that 2.5% figure is, is fairly arbitrary. I just figure we've kind of have used is it's a relatively small or a very small portion of uh, any profit that's being made. When you're starting out and you've got your initial bank roll, I would consider reinvesting a lot more than two and a half percent. And in fact, if possible, you just reinvest everything. That's how you're going to grow your bank roll quicker, but safely. You can raise the stakes as your bank gets bigger proportionally. So that's how I would would do it. Josh, is that how you've done it in the past, or if you, if you had a different approach? I probably took more kind of arbitrary jumps. So. If I had a service for horse racing, let's just say I was using £10 a point. If I had three months of straight profit, that might jump up to £15 a point. And then maybe after a year, it might be £25 a point. So that's one approach is to just move up in increments of whatever's easy for you. We actually did a feature on AI football recently. And the way that we did the staking there was 2.5% of the bank per bet. And that would obviously change day to day. So if you started with 100 points, you'd be staking two and a half points. If it went up to 110, you'd be up to, what's that, 2.75. So you were getting some kind of adjustment each day, either up or down. Yeah, I would suggest being a little bit more patient. So maybe having after X period of profit, then you adjust your bank. Lots of different ways to adjust upwards. I would maybe stick to just doing it after a set amount of time. That's how I, I did it when I was starting. Interesting. Interesting. So my, my, the other thing to, to note as well, I think, is that you, you can have different approaches. If, if you've got a number of services or tipsers that you're following, the question is, is do, you know, say one, one particular service is doing very well, do you start upping your stakes on that one, but not the others? Personally, I've shied away from that and I've had a more of a portfolio approach so I would just literally treat my betting bank as one betting bank covering all the, the services I'm covering and then when I hit a certain profit level I would increase the stakes across the board mm. no real logic to that other than I'm thinking well okay if a service has gone through a particular hot spell hot streak and I suddenly increase the stakes on that but not the others when I hit the the downturn is that going to erode my uh, the profit I've made more quickly than if I just spread it out across all the services. So the way I think is, look, I've got every faith in, in each of the strategies and services I'm using. So I'm looking at the collective as opposed to the individual. Having said that, it's really interesting what you're saying about AI football there, Josh, because I started following that just this yeah. week. I think about three, four bets, and one of those was postponed <laughs> and, and cancelled. So it's very early days, but I'm actually going to treat that as a separate strand. Yeah. So I'm kind of keeping that separate at the moment and see what happens when I use that 2.5% reinvestment strategy with that one service. Have you looked at the, the Excel sheet, Rowan? Because I was amazed by how much of a difference that made yes. to the profits. It's huge, isn't it? I, yeah. I think it's something, I can't remember the figure, it goes something like 90 points profit to 600 yeah. in the space of, what, just over a year, was it? It was The return on investment's lower. So it just shows that you're actually losing a bit of the return on investment, but you're getting this absolutely gargantuan rising profit. It blew me away when I looked at it. So yeah, that was why I mentioned that, because it was so impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, well, that's exactly why I'm, I'm running it in the yeah. way I am. <laughs> no way. But, so yeah, you, you're spot on there. Uh, but the, yeah, this, I guess the point we're trying to make here is there's different ways and it just whatever suits the individual. Some may prefer to do it service by service and look to compound and reinvest a certain amount in the individual service as it goes along. Or there's the collective approach where you just think, well, okay, well, I've got my whole portfolio, so that's the profit I'm going to reinvest in across all services. I quite like that idea though, Ron, because you know, the idea that service is hot or not, I know I, I don't always subscribe to that, but I can appreciate the theory. So if you have a portfolio of eight services and two of them have helped you push into a new profit high, you increase the stake for all eight rather than just the two that have made that profit. Yeah. The thinking being, well, those two, perhaps they're overperforming and the, uh, the other six might be underperforming, for example, or just breaking even and 
you think at some point, you know, you're going to reap the benefits when they come good. You know, I like that theory for myself. I do, from a practical perspective, there's a service that I follow and every week, basically every Sunday, Monday, I see if I've made a profit over the past week. And if I have, I'll increase my bankroll by two and a half percent. And I've been doing that for like about six months and the bankroll has grown so much quicker. And obviously the profits have grown so much more quicker by doing that. And it doesn't sound much, but you know, over this particular strategy makes a profit, I would say six weeks out of eight, seven weeks out of eight. So most weeks I'm increasing my bankroll and it just allows me to, to grow. And with my golf, I actually, you know, it's quite easy to do after every Sunday, uh, whenever a tournament finishes. And if I make, make a new profit high, I increase my stakes by a certain fixed financial amount. And, you know, I had nine losing tournaments on the bounce recently on the golf. So dropped down a fair bit. But actually, I've had a couple of winners since then and it's made a new profit. High, so I'm able to increase those those stakes again. But I don't, I know some people like to reduce stakes, you know, when they're in a losing run. I, I don't, I'll, I'll keep them level and I generally won't reduce them because I have enough cushion in my bankroll to kind of manage that per service. So I don't know if you guys have ever reduced stakes to if they're doing a losing run. No, I've not. I, I'm like you. I, I do exactly what you do there, Pete. I have a set bank. So once you've hit a profit high, okay, the, the pound per point or the euro per point value goes up, so you're staking more, but you should still have the same number of points in your bank. So theoretically, why would you reduce? I can understand why people do. I think this analyst does, doesn't it? When it reaches yep. a certain point of um, on the drawdown, he'll just drop the stakes a little bit until it builds back up. So look, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's just personal preference. I've never, I've never done that. I don't know about you, Josh. It would go back to something like Kelly, wouldn't it, where you're doing a, a percentage of your overall um, money in the bank. So that goes up and down with how profitable you've been. So yeah, I always find just a quick psychological point here that I never got too stressed about increasing the amount that I'm betting when it's money that I've already won. When you are reinvesting profits, it does change your psychology a bit because this is money that you've already made using a service or following somebody in. So it does change the way you think about it a little bit. Yeah, so that's a really good point. I guess what you can do as well is you, you could say when you get to a certain level, you could just take your initial investment out, couldn't you? Yeah. And then literally you're playing with profit yeah. and building from profit. So, yeah. that's, a, that's another question, but just how, when, how many do you take profit? Because, you know, for my approach will be if my account gets gobbed, it's gone. I take it out. Uh, but the other query is, you know, you've got uh, uh, places like uh, Betfair or other companies that are uh, applying affordability checks. So do you keep your money in those accounts as well? For me, it's really tricky. You know, I actually am. But if I can take my money out without fear of an account being closed or affordability, then that's great. I will take that and I'll add it back in if needs be. But it's a little tricky sometimes. But my general approach is to only take it out when an account gets closed. So that's something else to bear in mind when you think about bank for all management. Because if you, you know, you... Um, need enough money to spread around all those bookmakers because if you're going to keep those funds in those accounts for as long as that account is viable, you know, you you might be needing a decent sized bankroll or some cushion to think, well, I've got enough money, but I just can't access it. Um, it's just one of those problems that us gamblers face, isn't it? Yeah. I'd leave Betfair alone because I've always got that worry that um, I never want to be checked for affordability there. What I've done with other bookmaker accounts in the past, say if I had... Um, let's just make up a number. Said it was three thousand four hundred pounds in an account. I might take out nine hundred and leave two and a half thousand. So leave a nice round number in there, but then just take out a bit off, off the top so it wouldn't set too many alarm bells off. I didn't get too many accounts closed down on the back of taking out big wins, so that seemed to work. I think yeah, if you're taking out like a massive proportion, they might look at you a bit more closely. Yeah, on a similar vein, something I did with Skybet actually, with the winnings from from last year, Bet three six five, and a couple of others as well, was actually just take small increments out, but fairly regularly. Um, but at the same time, I might deposit to make it a a smaller amount, just to make it around. I mean, it's also very complicated. But ultimately, say you're withdrawing five hundred pounds, I would then deposit one hundred pounds to take the balance up to a nice round figure, and I never have any problems with checks or withdrawals not being processed some of the horror stories that you you hear of so this sounds like money laundering rowan <laughs> <laughs> oh, <bloody Lord. laughs> yeah, it's, i'll tell you what if you're asking the question when do you skim when do you take profit out um it's usually when my wife is booked a holiday or something <laughs> or, or <laughs> something expensive <laughs> yeah no no it's true yeah it's a tricky thing isn't it but uh 
there's, there's certainly things to consider like when you're when you're betting it's, it's a nice problem to have yeah it's, if, it's, if you're it's thinking a nice about, okay how, how do i how do i get my profit now and then then you know things are going all right aren't they? Uh, but it is case, sometimes it is case by case so some firms will like you say some of the tactics we've spoken about will be fine but you know, I had an experience recently where I had a really good balance in one particular site, and I was just nervous, so I took a tiny bit out. And then when that withdrawal was processed, the account got I got the gubbing email. So, but other firms that might not necessarily happen, um, maybe you know, just their checks and balances are all different. So there's no one size fits all approach, unfortunately, because each firm has got their own approach to it. Did you have any trouble accessing the rest of your balance? No, no, it all came out. You know, it's all in my name. Okay, it's all great, legitimate. Right, there was no reason for there to be an issue. But uh, yeah, it was just just unfortunate and I learned my lesson on that particular firm. But there's a point really, there isn't a when you get nervous sometimes if you've got just the way that bookmakers are and how they make life difficult. Yes. You just think, well, I'm a bit nervous. You know, if you got a sizable sum in that, a fairly decent amount, I think well, that money could be earning me interest. So, you know, you think whatever the interest rates are in some accounts these days, and obviously it's quite it's quite generous while well, they're increasing anyway compared to where it was a few years back. But uh, that money could be generating you some some extra cash rather than, than them. But uh, yeah. I don't like having big balances with any bookmaker. I, I keep it fairly. I'd rather make regular deposits and withdrawals. I mean, it's different. So, so with the exchanges now, so I use, tend to use markets more than that first just because I do. I won't have a huge balance in anywhere and I'll just have a separate bank account because I'm doing a lot in cash betting now. Then it's just easy to go to the cash machine with a cash card and get out whatever money you have. But I make a lot of deposits and withdrawals. So I guess it looks like normal behavior on on that account. And it was the same with the bookies too, because I get very nervous whenever there's a, a large amount with one firm. No, definitely. It's, it's something that you, know, you have to weigh up the pros and cons of keeping it in there or withdrawing it. There's no right or wrong answer on that. It's just whatever feels right to you and your bankroll and your comfort level. So uh, that's question three. Let's move on to question four. This is from Richard. Now, this is talking about tracking. Let me read it out first. Richard says, with family and work, life is busy. I stick my bets on with Betfair. And yes, there is the Betfair record I can download to Excel, but that doesn't distinguish tipsters and it doesn't go back more than three months. So using my own data from Betfair, it's almost impossible to keep any clear track of stakes Returns, ROI, et cetera, across different tipsters. You've also got to work hard in Excel to even work out what you've paid in commission. If I had time at the end of the day, I could re-enter all the bets and results into a tracker, tipster by tipster. But that's quite a bit of work if you placed 20 bets that day. Is there a tracker to which I could transfer data from Betfair on a daily or weekly basis and then add in a tipster category? Then I can see a bit more clearly what's happening for save the time of retyping a, a ton of detail from scratch. Cheers, Richard. Now, Richard's question is specific to Betfair and how you can track it, but I think there's a general question there of how you can track performance and how we observe our own performance from the tipsters and things that we follow across different bookmakers. Josh, I think you had some thoughts on this one. Yeah, um, I actually take a lot of time doing mine, so I do mine manually into Excel. But just from Richard's question, there are a few little tips here. So if you want something automated, there's BF Bot Manager, which we did a recent review on. That was written by Justin, one of our members. So within that, you upload a CSV file, which is basically an Excel file, and it will split down your um, into tipster, obviously into the market, and it will give you your net return. So that would do it all automatically for you. And obviously, you'd be able to go back and have a look over weeks or months, even years, uh, to see how each tips has performed. In terms of getting his returns with Betfair Commission taken off, I just suggest that he goes to profit and loss instead of going to bet history. So when you're on my account on Betfair, there's bet history, there's my bets. Uh, he wants to be going on um, betting profit and loss because when you download that into Excel, the returns will be net of the commission taken away. So that would be my quick tip there. And obviously within that, it does give you a breakdown of what the sport was. So if he's got like a greyhound tipster, a horse racing tipster and a, a football tipster, I know they call it soccer on there, that would split it all down for you there, just straight from bet there. BF Bot Manager would be the place I'd be suggesting that Richard goes if he wants a bit of a shortcut. Yeah, because there is no, apart from that and using some tools like BF Bot Manager or Betfair's, uh, because there's different stats that they produce and profit and loss figures and tallies. Uh, there is no general way if you've got like tipsters across different bookmakers and exchanges that you're placing beyond the actual manual logging of them. Now, my approach is I don't log 
every single bet, I more look at my balances from bookmakers and my performance. And some sports I do drill into. So I know what I've done on tennis. I know what I've done on golf. Um, I, I kind of settle that on a, sometimes a weekly basis and I keep a track of where my bankroll is on that front. So and other bits and pieces, I, I, you know, I do work with other people that help me log that to, and we'd log it in, in a kind of a fashion ourselves. But I don't do the whole bet by bet placement and tracking, unfortunately. Well, you know, to a certain extent, I know the bets I'm placing are value or not. I don't necessarily need to then benchmark and understand, you know, what my theoretical ROI is or my CLV is. I know some people like to do it, like you, Josh, and, you know, you keep a record of yeah. it. And I guess, you know, Rowan as well, bring you in here because you're betting in shops a lot these days and tracking your performance, especially when you're dealing with cash and betting slips, you don't have that hard copy online for you to check and cross-reference your performance. How do you keep a tally of everything? So, yes, that's, that's interesting. It's something that I had to adjust to big time from using online books where I think you can see everything that you place to having betting slips here, there and everywhere. So it was, I had to get myself organised. So the way I do it is that I will keep every betting slip together that I've, that I've got from each bookmaker. I will number them <laughs> and then uh, I will check my returns on a daily basis. Uh, and then when I go and collect the, uh, the proceeds of any returns I get, I'll make sure it's accurate. I'll have worked out very carefully what the return should be on each bet because I think we have to accept that bookmakers can make mistakes, usually honest mistakes. They don't do it deliberately. Sometimes maybe you, you wonder but somebody working behind the counter may just miscalculate exactly what it, sh- it that they should be. So I stay on top of it that way. Similar to UP, I don't record individual bets, but I will at all times know how much I've staked for each service or strategy I use, what my profit or loss is with each of those strategies, what my current ROI is for my own interest. And most importantly, I will then bring everything together so I know what my betting bank is at any one time. And I will try and do that on a, on a nightly basis. Sometimes it may be two or three nights before I can catch up. But yeah, so I, I make sure I have the basics, but I'm not too interested in individual bet performance. It's just, um, yeah, I, I think I'd be there all night if I was recording and logging every single bet. So I think that's up to the individual. <laughs> do you have a float or how do you deal with cash? Do you have a separate wallet that you use? How do you... Yeah, so I, I have a, a, a separate bank account. And as I said before, a moment or so ago, that I'll, I'll just go and get cash out if I need to. I'll have a float, very much as if you were running a small shop, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> I've, uh, I've turn around now, I've got an envelope with, with, with a certain amount of, of cash in it and um, you do it that way. I can't think of any other way to do it. To be honest, when you're betting in cash, you, you need a flow and you also need fairly quick access to more cash if, if you need it from, from the bank. Yeah, interesting. No, it's just a very different way. And I was just intrigued how, how it all works. So I'm betting shops at the moment myself and the actual practical practicality of handling a lot of cash and, you know, if that cash gets spent on other things that isn't betting, you know, and making sure that those two don't, don't clash as well, so... It's very important you keep it separate. And and talking about, as we were, sort of what you do with, with profit. So, for example, last weekend was a really good one for me. So I had a, a, a bigger amount of cash than I'm comfortable carrying around some of the less salubrious parts of South Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> into the book is in. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll put a certain amount in that bank account. Just I'll go to the bank with the cash and, and stick it in. And it, it works It works very well. But that's why it's so important. And I, I do get a little bit OCD about this, about knowing exactly what my betting bank is because it's very easy i think with cash to lose track and it's also very easy just to even if it's just a fiver because you you know when you're going to pick up some money i must be lunch time and greg's is there and you want you want to uh, a pasty and or something or other it's very easy just to, to dip into your, what is your betting bank so it's very important you just keep things 100%. How much are you spending at Greg's? It's only a pound, isn't it, for free sausage rolls? <laughs> Depends on how much you eat, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I was in, I was like, I'm, a pound for free. I'm a growing lad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 51 is still I can't remember the last time I spent less than a tenner. Stay yeah. big. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so that's question four. That's uh, quite a lot of good uh, insight on that one. So question five, we're going to move from betting the shops. We're betting with Pinnacle. Now, we've talked about Pinnacle. Now, we're going back to question two, which was a question about bet brokers. One of the reasons that people use bet brokers is that it gives you access to Pinnacle. Uh, Pinnacle Sports are the world's sharpest bookmaker. They'll take 
substantial bets and you know they are sharp in terms of their lines and their markets so whatever pinnacle does uh, helps shape the market with all kinds of soft bookmakers as well so there's a question that came in from sohail who's asking about dimitrio giotti now if you're not familiar with dimitrio he is a european basketball tipster who has got an excellent i think 60 percent roi record at uh, pinnacle prices and actually makes about eight or nine percent to the pinnacle closing line prices. So Sahil is a member and he was asking, I'm wondering what sort of limits are expected at Pinnacle with his plays because what's important to understand with Pinnacle is that the closer to the start time of a game or a match, the greater those limits will increase. It's a bit like horse racing. So if you try and bet on horse racing the night before with I don't know, bet three six five. You, you know, you're not going to have a limit there necessarily. You're not going to put it forward like Pinnacle will, but they're going to be willing to take less action the night before than they might do five minutes before the race actually starting. And it's a bit like this with Pinnacle, although they're a lot more transparent on that. So if you're betting on, well, I had recently I chatted to Skeev in a little piece that I did with him talking about his own non-league football. So he bets in the the conference league. And whilst he could bet on a Thursday afternoon, the limits there might be $200. Now, and then he bets, he actually advises bets at 2 p.m. on a Saturday and the limits there are a few thousand. So it just shows you, you can get a lot more on. And the good thing with Pinnacle is that every time the odds move or the line moves, you can rebet. So if you take the maximum is $1,000 at 2.0, uh, you place that and then perhaps the line moves to 1.98. You can rebet whatever the maximum is again at that point. So you can continue to bet into it. And obviously they they uh, don't limit. But what Demetrio does is because there's a balance and you'll find good tipsters understand this in that if they bet too early, not enough value is going to be able to be obtained by members. But if you bet too late, maybe that value has gone because other people have spotted it. So with him, he's betting, he says, I try to submit bets when the markets are relatively mature and there is four-digit liquidity on Pinnacle. However, you're not betting into a vacuum and value bets, by definition, are getting backed by smart money all the time. And obviously, if it's a value bet, you should expect that the prices uh, will contract over time. So he, like I say, he makes 16% ROI and then 9% or 8% at closing value. So there's an 8% shift there, but there's obviously still an edge at closing prices to obtain. But you would be concerned if you were you know, getting 16% a day before and then 25% at the start of the game, the closing line. And a bit like with Betfair SP, you know, if you are beating Betfair SP, then that's your value edge there for for horse racing and it's very similar and instead of using Betfair SP when you're betting on basketball or football or or tennis you're going to use the closing line prices there so that's the take on that one and uh, it's important to understand how Pinnacle works and how basically the Asian markets work as well and the money that they will will take on it. Josh, Rowan, did you have anything to, to add to my answer there? No, my answer was going to be using Demetrio and you've pretty much covered everything I was going to say. So, yeah, it's really impressive that Demetrio waits for there to be four-digit liquidity. Otherwise, he would be taking prices that are just unobtainable. So it's a really well-run service. Did some work on it yesterday. And yeah, that that uh, return, the pinnacle closing price is just remarkable, um, above 8%, considering that basically all of the smart people in the world have spoken at that point and he's still beating them. Just brilliant. So. Yeah, especially when you get to a European basketball and people might think, well, European basketball, how big is that? Well, maybe it's not as big in the UK as it certainly is in the continent. But then you are waiting until there's four figures and it's a bit like, you know, the ski for an hour before. I don't think you bet with Pinnacle, do you, at the the moment, Rowan? No, no, sadly. (laughs) (laughs) It's a sad day when they uh, withdrew from the UK. But no, I've I've not been uh, messing with Pinnacle for quite some time. Well, we might change that because we were talking prior to the podcast about... (laughs) getting you uh, hooked up with some so uh, yes <laughs> watch this space <laughs> we'll have a chat <laughs> yeah, yeah question six gents uh, i think this is one that you, you you're going to sink your teeth into uh josh uh, it's from jack uh, i've actually had quite a few emails with jack over the years a really shrewd guy a really good member hi there just listen to part two of the stages five stages of profitable and podcast so i should reiterate that's part two is for sbc members only and where we get into some of the tipsters so if you're interested in that go check that one out Jack was interested in which smaller bookmakers we would recommend, ones that you won't find on Odds Checker, the sequence to open them in, which ones to avoid, etc. Any advice, greatly appreciated. So that's from Jack. Josh, get stuck in. Okay, so 
even though we've got two pages for this, one of them is major major bookmakers, one's independent bookmakers. Start with the major bookmakers because even though we say major, a lot of them you won't have heard of. So they're grouped together and it does become quite complicated. It's a bit labyrinthine the way all these organizations are set up. So if you're thinking about what's on Odds Checker, you've got your Bet365, you've got Betfred, you've got Boyle Sports. I'm trying to think of any others that are completely independent from everybody else. I think that may well be it. Then you've got your Flutter Brands. So you've got Paddy Power, Betfair and Skybet, group them together. You've got the Bet Victor crew. So that's Bet Victor, Parry Match, and one that's not on the Odds Checker grid, which is Talk Sport Bet. Then you've got this nice little group of bookmakers that are all related to each other, but you can access them quite easily. So the first ones would be the FSB Technology Group. So my computer's just frozen for a second, but I'm sure the list is going to come up again. Um, one of them is on the Odds Checker grid, and that's Quimbet. We can't, can't endorse betting with Quimbet too much <laughs> after some of our experiences down the years. Google Quimbet, that's what I'll say. Just Google Quimbet. Yeah, and then Google Sean Quinn. <laughs> there was a recent Amazon film about him, which was very interesting. I'm not going to say any more than that. Yeah, we'll leave that there. Um, so yeah, within that group, you've got Quimbet, The Pools, Bet 600, Bet Goodwin, Fafabet, Fit Stairs, Tommy French Bookmakers have now been taken off, so I'll have to do that on our page. Now, what's good about this is, all of those bookmakers I've just listed all use the same odds. They use the same place terms. They have the same markets, but they're all independent from each other. So let's say that you bet with the pools and you win quite a bit of money and they close you down. You can then go and bet with Bet600 and they're not going to be related straight away to say, oh, Mr. Peter Ling has just rinsed us for five grand. <laughs> so we're going to stop him from betting with the other one. It's not like you're going to get with Paddy Power and Betfair. But there is a big but here. I did some work on um, a steamers project that Pete and I were looking at earlier on in the year. And I had pairs of these bookmakers open at the same time. And what we found, I think you found this too, didn't you, Pete? I was did. that even though they're not the same company, they were still talking to each other. So what we would recommend based on our poor experiences is maybe to leave a little bit of time between, between using each one. So there's a group there that all have the same odds. There's one other group. Again, you may have heard some of these names before. They're not the same company, but their websites all look the same. So this next group is what we've labelled Caramba clones. So within that, you've got Caramba, who a bit like Quimbet, we won't recommend based on some feedback we've had. Also some of our experiences. And we've got Bet Target, Mr. Mega and Mr. Play. Now, again, they have the same markets, same place terms, everything else, same prices. And you can use these. So we've ju I've just listed, I think, 10 bookmakers that are very similar to what's on Odds Checker, if not identical, that you can work through one by one. The one thing I'll say that I've learned from experience is don't open two from one group at the same time, and you should be okay. So there's uh, my first bit of advice for, was it Tom who asked the question? It was Jack. Jack, sorry, sorry, Jack. I'm just good, Tom. Yeah, obviously, there's other groups on the Austrian grid. You've got Labrooks and Coral together. They're also together with Sporting Bet and B Win. So you've got to be careful about using all those at the same time. Now, after you've looked at all of those, you can then move across to our independent bookmakers page. Now, within this, you can have people like uh, Star Sports, uh, Ben Keith's bookmakers, Jeff Banks, um, <laughs> the well known. Jeff Banks, <laughs> um, some of the new bookmakers like um, Dragon Bet and AK Bets. We'd recommend using these, maybe using them in a slightly different way. So you don't want to be going in and trying to place big bets with these small independent bookmakers. They're going to have lower limits. They're not going to have as many markets, but they will offer you fair prices and you'll be able to get decent bets on, especially in the more liquid markets. So they're good outlets for bets. Say if you want to bet on Premier League football, they'll take your bets. Uh, within that list as well, we've got people like Joe Jennings. McCartan Bet I've used personally. They're very good, as are Kaluki. Um, I know that Oslers are very well thought of by anyone who uses, wants to find a horse racing bet. So there's so many on all of these pages that we've made over the last year. There's got to be, what, 25 bookmakers listed there. Mm -hmm. So there's so many outlets if you've been shut down by the big boys. Um, lots of places for you to get your bets down. End of speech. No, that's, that's great. There's, there's a lot there. That was a good one. I will say some of those smaller, <laughs> smaller independent ones you probably can get lumpier bets on 
on certain sports, you're probably not going to get. Yeah. Like, let's say you've got a racing bet and, you know, it's an hour before we're off and, and Bet365 are five to one and everyone else is nine to two. You're going to get five to one with an independent, one of those firms, but they might lay you nine to two. You know, it's a general price, a bit like with the golf or whatever. Some of those other sports, they will take lumpy bets. You know, I'll probably get a, a strongly worded WhatsApp from Mr. Anthony Kaminsky if I didn't make that one clear about his service. So, <laughs> but that that's there uh, and you can, you know, you can bet on like horse racing with some of these firms as well, but you're not going to be able to take early prices or, you know, try and take lucky 15s on each way value. They're not going to offer you extra places. So, yeah, that's 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 what I'd add in there, and I would just reiterate again, like about not trying to open two from the same group at the same time. I think we were talking prior to this pod, weren't we, uh, Josh? Like I had an account with Caramba I had for six months, lightly used, and then I think it was Mister Mega, and they I was hitting it hard. You know, fair enough, I expected to get limited. It got limited, and then within five minutes, I got an email from Caramba saying my account there had gone. So I hadn't really used it. Yeah, for a while, you know, I was too focused on uh, elsewhere, and clearly there was some connection there between those firms. So you will find whether that's genuine, like part of the same company, we're able to get to the bottom of that, or whether it's just you know there's a list or there's communication in some form that says get rid of this customer. Yeah, I'll just try and make that clear. So the difference between what we might get with an odds checker firm, if you are successful with William Hill, eight 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 will close you down at the same time. If you're successful with Paddy Power, Betfair will shut you down at the same time. What you're saying there, Pete, and what we've both experienced is these firms that are kind of very loosely linked, they won't do that, but they will if you're showing activity at the same time on both accounts or if you've got them both open at the same time. So it's better just to open them one by one, like you said. Yeah, that's the difference. And one quick note about horse racing with some of those firms like Oslus, Bet, Kaluki. They're very straightforward in the fact that they will tell you what their lay to lose limits are at certain times of the day. So Oslers, I think they they will lay a thousand pounds up to nine o'clock, and then it goes up in small increments before the race starts. They're not like you bet three six fives and everyone else. They'll just tell you you can only place this amount up to this time. So it's very transparent about what the deal is. You might not get all the the extra places and the best odds guaranteed and five pound free bets, but they'll stand a bet. So that's the difference that you're getting there. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, Roman, any experience of any of these firms or anything to add there? I, I haven't actually, because I, I can't, when we started working on this and exploring the the independent bookmaker angle, I, I that was co- coincided with me coming away from bookmakers and setting myself up to be out and about with the cash. So no, it's not really an area that I've targeted, but I've got somebody that I'm, I'm working with, also known as my... He gets some abuse on this podcast, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's looking to make some extra income to see his, through his, his studies. So it, it's going to be really interesting, actually, because uh, I'm going to be watching him go through to about the five stages. He's at stage one, very much at stage one, getting a betting band together. And it's actually going to be really interesting for me because I can obviously steer him towards these independent books and start seeing how they work. And then, of course, I can start maybe coming back a little bit myself to um to using these books as well because if you if you just it sounds to me like if you if you've got a what a bookmaker who's going to stand you a bet and you're not fussed about the the sort of the bells and whistles as you said josh with the free bets and enhanced prices uh, places and all that sort of thing then it's a really good outlet so actually i'm just looking forward to um to exploring this myself the other thing rowan as well i was moving towards just using exchanges and using like shops and everything else. What I had about six months ago was kind of like a second wind. It was like rediscovering the odds checker bookmakers again because they're just very similar. The first bookmakers I was listing there, people like Bet Goodwin, even Kaluki, some of those bookmakers, they're just very, very similar to what you get on odds checker. So you can actually employ some of the things that you did a year ago that you can't do anymore. You can have yeah. a go at doing them again. So yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I can see myself doing exactly that actually yeah. in, in, in the near future. Because I think, yeah, watching um, watching my lad go through it, I think that's going to kind of inspire me. So well, actually, I can take advantage of these. Wait for it to be cold, and then you can stay in the warmth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad shout. Yeah, yeah, a lot of common sense there. Good one. <laughs> well, the gist is, you know, when you get good by Bet three six five or Skybet, it's not the end of the world, right? That's what we're trying to illustrate through the five stages. Whether you go into Pinnacle first, or whether you know, some of the sharp tipsters that we advocate, or whether you get into shops, or whether you start to go through some of these tier two, tier three, tier four bookmakers, whatever however you want to term them, 
but there are options out there. Some of them, like you say, you have to put more work in. So, you know, if you're betting on horse racing, for example, you can't just take the early prices. You have to wait and see what you can obtain or what's available later on in the day. But if you, you know, if you have a value bet and you can place that with a bookmaker who is willing to take your business, even though you might make a profit and, you know, they're able to trade you like a, like a genuine bookmaker can and should do, then there are options there for you. So, you know, don't be frustrated or put off by the fact, oh, bookmakers, this and that, they're going to close me down and not going to get paid. You know, I think that obviously is an issue, people not getting paid, and we see that being highlighted. I understand that's getting more tackled and become more of a focal point for people working in the, you know, kind of the regulation side of it at the moment. Uh, We might not see that come to fruition just straight away, but generally that only really is more of a problem as well if people are multi-counting and so on. But if you're betting in your own name and, uh, you know, doing it on a genuine basis, then you you know, you will always, you should always get paid out. And there are ways and means for you to, to kind of chase that up if, if needs be. So there's lots of different options there. So don't be put off thinking that Bet365 is the only game in town. There's certainly lots of options there. Gents, is there anything else? And we tackled all the questions. Is there anything else you wanted to add in to any of the questions or anything you think would be good to put across to listeners before we wrap up? Uh, no, I, I, I've not really. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this because I, I think, you know, when you sit down and, you, and you, you have a chat about these things, you kind of pick things up and learn things yourself as well. Um, so there's, there's, there's a couple of points that I'm thinking, actually, yeah, I was just mainly just talking about it, weren't we, about the other bookmakers, the other options out there. We've said before that if you're following the right people, you will make a good profit. The, the, perhaps the challenge is getting on, but it, it seems clear to me that there are many, many options to explore, which is is great. Uh, so that's the only thing I'm adding is that I'm learning, yeah. learning good stuff myself, sitting here talking it all through. Great stuff. Well, I, I've enjoyed it a great deal as ever. Like I say, I've got a lot of insight from it myself. I enjoy chatting to you because you both got slightly different approaches to me. And for those people that are interested in learning more, go and listen to episode 59. If you've got an SBC membership, there's a second part you can listen to there. And even if you're not a member, there's a bunch of material on site. We've got five stages, uh, pages, and some blog posts about it. And we've got some interviews with other people and what they're doing. So just trying to give you as much uh, material inspiration and advice as as, uh, as we possibly can. So thank you to both you, uh, Josh and Rowan, for joining me today. And thanks for listening. To, if you have any feedback, we, we welcome all of that, of course. Uh, I think we're all off to go and get a, uh, a couple of sausage rolls and a nice bun from Greg's, aren't we, guys? <laughs> Greg's a shot, Pete. Where are we at? Starters. Starters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks ever so much, guys. And thanks to everyone for listening. We'll speak to you again soon.